Let's look at the book of Job. Now, we got a problem here. I love it when there's a so-called contradiction in the Bible. Amen. Because whenever you see Woo! that, it means there's a, another gold mine That's right. that you're going to find out. See? A lot of people, they'll argue the Bible is relative. You can interpret whatever. It's so abstract, mystical, blah, 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 blah. There's so many contradictions. But they don't realize it's when they actually study the verses, it's actually showing them a more advanced, a deeper, and a more amazing revelation. I mean, that's why a lot of the videos that we were able to post, why were they so interesting, fascinating? Because you dig deeper in the verses. Yep. See that? Not just like, oh, reading clearly to your language and stuff like that. Then how can you find greater revelation from the omniscient mind of God? Mm -hmm. It takes studying and looking verse, verse, scripture with scripture. So let's look at the contradiction here, which is a problem. Look at the book of Job, and that's the final chapter. So that's chapter 42. And this doesn't make sense here. We're going to start off at uh, verse 10. So remember, if you know the story of Job, Job went through much hard times and trials. And then finally God restored to him double. But look at this. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. So Job got twice as much. Now look at verse 12. <clears throat> So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. So Job got double the portion, right? But keep reading here. For he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 she asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters. Okay, so notice right here he has ten children. Ten children. Now I'm not going to go through all the she asses and he asses and all that kind of stuff. But can you tell me... Uh, well, actually, I'll just look it up right here real quick. I'm just being lazy. So 14,000 sheep, right? So he had here 14,000 sheep, and then the other remaining part of his flock and cattle, whatever doubled it was, and then 10 children. Now compare that with Job 1. Keep your hand at Job 42, though. Keep your hand at Job 42. Now go to Job 1. We're going to look at Job 42 quite often. Look at Job chapter 1, and let's see Job's possession here. Look at verse three, uh, verse 2. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters, right? That matches with Job 42, right? Uh, verse 3, his substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses. Now remember, if you read Job 42... And we read verse uh, 12 through 13. Now we're comparing this with Job 1, uh, 2 to 3, right? Now this is where Bible scholars get all in cahoots and confusion. So unless you're a Bible-believing uh, preacher, you would know this stuff. But those who aren't Bible believers, they don't know this interesting thing. So let's look at right here. 14,000 sheep, but Job chapter 1 says 7,000, right? Sheep? Mm -hmm. So he had 7,000 sheep here. And then right here, he mentions the same amount of children, right? Uh, seven sons and three daughters, is that correct? Yes, sir. So, okay, so ten children here. So this is what a lot of Bible preachers are assuming. What they're assuming is... When Job, in his latter end, so let's put the latter end here, okay? That way we can see the difference with these two. His original state. And then this is his latter state. So that one was double. That's not a problem. But then the ten children. So what they're assuming is this. What they're assuming is that <clears throat> when the Lord mentioned his ten children... He meant ten more children, if you're not a KJV Bible believer. And then you'll use Greek and Hebrew, and then a modern version, oh, it's probably ten more. That's what it meant. So thus, it'll be twenty children. Now, you know why this becomes a contradiction or a problem in the Bible? I'll tell you why this is a problem. Because if you <laughs> look at Job chapter 42, and look at verse 16, okay, verse 16. After this, Job, uh, after this lived Job an hundred and forty years, and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. 
Okay, so he lived up to 140 years, right? Now, Dr. Ruckman, he uh, gives this kind of solution, which is very reasonable. So he starts up this way. Uh, the standard teaching is that Job had ten more children by an unknown woman after his restoration. But this adding of ten new children to Job would put him at 200 years old when he died, even if the kids were born two years apart. Verse 16 says that Job lived 140 more years after he had the children of verse 13 through 14. Job had to be at the very least 40 years old. For his sons were all grown up with houses of their own. Because if you look at Job chapter 1, remember his original state? The Bible says he had ch 10 children, right? If you kept reading the verses, it says that they had their own houses and possessions. So they were already grown up, see? They were already grown up that time. So think about it, that if he had 10 more children, do you know how fast that would be? <laughs> Even if it's two years apart? That's like really not a good rate to go to. So his solution was this. His solution, he keeps arguing right here that um, if he had his ten new children two years apart, and not many men have ten children after forty, that would place him at uh, that would place him at sixty. A hundred forty years after that would have made Job two hundred years old at his death. Abraham did not even live that long. Genesis twenty-five verse seven, and he was two generations before Job. Genesis chapter 36, verse 33. So you see that? With this, with this rate, this wouldn't make sense. The solution to the problem is simple. And he says this, Job's children were resurrected. So that's his, uh, that's his explanation. Is that rather than this way, it's that these ten children were resurrected. Now, but this still remains a problem, it seems like, and a contradiction. This still seems like a problem. The reason why is because, look back at Job 42, and because our dear brother Tom, he's a Bible corrector, and then he doesn't believe Bible-believing preachers. He's like, Pastor, that doesn't make sense, you know, because look at this verse. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Actually, it's because he, he did that, we were able to discover more gold mines, actually. Amen. I told you, brethren, that's why you have to independently study for yourself. You can't just say, oh, they were resurrected. I believe you, Pastor. No, you got to study right. it. That's right. If you study it, you'll be more impressed. Like, wow, this makes even more sense. Okay, so let's just do this, okay? First part is this. Verse 12, the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. And it lists his double portion, right? Here's the problem. It's not that his children were resurrected, if you read verse 13. He had also seven sons and three daughters. See that? So it shows right here, he, God doubled his portion, and he also had ten children. See, not that they were resurrected, but that he also had ten children. See? So that's why this thing would not make sense, this resurrection thing. That's the problem. So then I was like, you know, that's a very good point. So then I was going back and forth with Tom, and we went one to two hours trying to figure out what it was. So we were thinking this. So remember, the original theory, okay, so here are two theories, all right? The original theory, as you might recall, is that these were uh, ten new children, right? But then Dr. Ruckman and other Bible-believing preachers, they argue that this would not make sense because of the two-year-apart thing, right? Now, this is what I thought, okay? Now, that's why I'm very objective and fair. I just don't go with one preferable theory. I, I look through everything and find out which one makes sense. So first of all, I was, I was saying, well, maybe, the uh, maybe this theory was correct and maybe Dr. Upton was wrong on something because I thought of it this way. This is a very simple solution. He had multiple wives. So if you had multiple wives, that would make sense. But then when Tom and I were, but why doesn't this work though, okay? I was like, well, that would make sense then. But then when Tom and I were discussing, it did not make sense. Okay, remember, Job went through hell with his wife, right? What did the wife say? Curse God and die. Do you think he, after that, with one woman, he wants to have five more women after that? I was like, yeah, I don't know. But another thing is this too. Another thing is that I do know this, if you read during Job's timeline, which is Abraham's timeline, 
they weren't known to have, they didn't have that many wives. Not many people had it. It was like until later on in the Old Testament you see that. Abraham had one wife, Sarai. Lot had one wife. Abraham, he only married another one, which was his concubine, because Sarai convinced him to do so. Noah had one wife. Adam had one wife. So the polygamy thing was not that rampant. There were multiple wives, but it wasn't as common compared to Moses' law during, during that time period, I noticed. That seemed to make more sense. So because of that, and not only that with Job, I can't, it does not make sense, especially with what Job went through, okay? Job's past experience with his wife doesn't make sense. I don't think he'd want to have, he'd want to experience five more after that, okay? And not only that, it doesn't seem uh, that much common. Like I said, um, there were some people who did have multiple wives, but it's not really as common compared to Moses' timeline. Not only that, if you read Job chapter 1, Job, it only mentioned Job had one wife, right? Yeah, so, I, so it kind of makes sense right there. Not only that, here's what's interesting as well. If you read Job 42, did you ever notice Job's wife or marriage is never mentioned ever? It's his children restored, not his marriage yeah. or his wife. There is no mention whatsoever. Show something right here. So that's why I was like, you know, I mean, this seemed like an easy answer, but I was like, but with all these things, it just doesn't make sense. So I had to go back to the resurrection thing. I was like, dude, this does not make sense. So he had also, see? So that's what we argued. But here's the thing, which it may be more simple than I thought, okay? Verse 12, it mentions about his restoration, right? His doubling. Verse 13 could be recalling his past of what he owned. His seven sons and three daughters. Verse 14 and 15. So it's going back into the past of what he owns. So what I'm basically saying is this. What I'm basically saying is that when it mentions 14,000 sheep, which is Job chapter 42, right? Recent. Then it also goes back to the past as well, which is Job chapter 1. So it's talking about everything that he owned from now to the past. But I was like thinking, well, I don't know if that's the case. But this is very possible and even likely. The reason why is this. When the Bible talks, the Bible, when you read a passage, it may refer, it may talk about a recent timeline, but it also jumps back to the past. And if you read your Bible multiple times, you know that's true. <laughs> you know when you read your Bible, when it's talking about what's currently happening, it just jumps back into the past sometimes. Here's a good example. Let's go to um, Genesis, the book of Genesis, and we'll look at chapter 42, I think. Look at the book of Genesis. And we'll look at chapter 35, excuse me, chapter 35. Now, I'm not going to, for time's sake, okay, there's just so little time and so much to say, so I'm just going to say this quickly. So here's a separate topic here. Now, before we read Genesis chapter 35, if you all know the story of Jacob, like about 10 chapters ago or somewhere like that in the past, Jacob, he went to Bethel, right? He went to Bethel. Genesis 35 talks about him going to Bethel again, okay? Now, if you read the past chapter in Genesis, the Bible says Jacob gave the name Bethel. He named it already, Bethel, at the past at Genesis. But look at Genesis 35. This is where it gets kind of confusing. Genesis 35 and verse 6. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him, and he fled from the face of his brother. Uh, let's keep reading right here, verse uh, 14. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him. 
where he talked with God, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him what? Bethel. Well, this is confusing here, okay? Genesis 35 claim, Jacob gave the name Bethel. But no, if you look at past Genesis, well, we'll just look at there right quickly. I'm not going to read it for time's sake, but just go over there real quick, okay? If You can just skim through it quickly. Look at the book of Genesis, chapter 28, yeah, chapter 28, okay? Chapter 28. You'll notice in verse 18, see? He rose up early, set up a pillar of stones, poured oil upon it, right? That's repeating chapter 35. Verse 19, he called the name of that place what? Bethel. Okay, so this is confusing here. Genesis 35 said he went back to Bethel. But then it repeats the same conundrum. He poured the oil, put a pillar of stone, and called it Bethel. No, that already happened. You know why? Because this is common in the Bible. In Genesis 35, what was going on was he did go back to Bethel, but then the passage is going back to the past, see? And the easiest example is Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, right? Mm -hmm. Atheists thought that was a contradiction too, right? Yeah. But what the Bible is doing in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is that it's telling you what's going on with God's creation and going back to the past again of all the details of what happened. So, see, that's common throughout the Bible. So this is very, very possible, okay? And even likely too, it's like likely. But this builds up even more. This becomes more convincing when you think of it this way. Go to Job again, Job 42. What's the Bible talking about right here? It's talking about what Job is blessed with, what Job owns, right? So that's why you may have mentioned his sons and daughters in that sense. So let me explain here. Look at Job chapter 42. And look at verse 12. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For, so see, the Bible in verse 12 is telling you what Job is blessed with by God. See that? And it's telling you what he possesses, what he's blessed with. From verse 12 and 13. So here's what I argue here, okay? So let me give with a simple example right here. That I tried to with our brother Tom here earlier. So let's say right here, brother, uh, the Lord blessed him, right? God blessed. Let's say that I said, Brother Tom, five years ago, okay, five years ago, the Lord blessed Tom with, let's say, salvation. No, 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 stop, <laughs> stop, okay, so, three children. The Lord blessed Tom with three children and $50,000, okay? <laughs> so let's say the, the Bible says the Lord, uh, not the Bible, let's say that five years ago, God blessed Tom. So forget Bible here, let's think common sense, that way you can get this, okay? Five years ago, the Lord blessed Tom with three children and $50,000. Today, today, the Lord blessed Tom with three children and $100,000. Does that mean that the children changed or the money changed? The money changed. Money changed. But you're not confused here, right? Why? Because I'm giving a cumulative total of God's blessing on Tom. That's good, yeah. So that's what Job is doing. See that? Oh, great. This is the easiest explanation. I thought that I had a hard time going back and forth. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Tom, uh, because, because I discussed with Tom, I found the right wording to use. Cumulative total. That was the best there thing to do. So... When I said that way, that makes sense. So in Job 42, see, Job chapter 1 was telling you God blessed Job with 10 children and 7,000 sheep, see? But then Job 42 is saying God blessed Job with 14,000 sheep and 10 children. See, that's why the also is there. So it's giving you a cumulative total of God's blessing. See that? There's no confusion here. But this becomes more evident. I'm really convinced of this theory because, well, not theory. I believe this is true. Because keep reading. If you read uh, verse 13, he had seven sons, three daughters. 
He called the name of the first Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Keren Hapuk. And in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. Now look at this. See, in verse 15, when Job had these children, Job already gave them an inheritance. They were already grown up. They already matured, and Job gave them inheritance. Then, verse 16, it says, after this, Job lived 140 years. See that? So if we were to say that these were 10 new children, then the Bible says Job had to wait till they were all grown up, so let's say 30 years or 25 years. Then Job gave them an inheritance. Then after that, he lived 140 years. No, that doesn't make sense. It makes sense that we have to put this as a cumulative total of present and past. Why? If we were to say in verse 16, 140 years, see, with already his children grown up, it makes sense they were resurrected. But this is undoubtedly cumulative total, past and present. You know why? Because look at verse 17. So Job died being old and full of days. See that? It's giving a cum everything about Job's life here. See that? So it makes more sense to put this as a cumulative total. If you insist 10 new children, it really does not make sense with the time gap, and especially with what he experienced with his wife. But not only that, the greatest, uh, what's even stronger as the evidence is this one, which is really fun and interesting. Go back to Job 42, and before God gave you a cumulative total of what God gave Job, what did he say at verse 10? That's the key, verse 10. And the Lord, what? Turn the captivity of Job. That's the key word. Do you know why? If you look up every time the Bible mentions about uh, God turning the captivity, captivity, it's mostly about the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. And you know what it's referring to? Restoration. Yep. See that? So Israel will get back its promised land. Yep. See that? they will uh, be restored to what they have. So that's why this makes a lot of sense. There's too many verses. Look at all the verses that mentions about captivity and God turning their captivity. It's about restoration, see that? But they're also blessed more because they have the old stuff with the new stuff, see that? So that's what God did. God gave them the old stuff, restoration, with his ten children, but also added new stuff by double, uh, doubling his uh, flock, etc., see that? So that would make sense. That would make a lot more sense. Now, as much as I want to turn to verses about captivity, we're not going to do that for time's sake, but look at all the verses where it talks about captivity. It becomes a gold mine of Bible doctrine. And you know what it comes down to? So I unfortunately can't do it on this video. But I'm just going to say this. If you look at every word in the Bible that talks about captivity, most of the time it refers to his nation of Israel being restored. That's why, you know why, what's a really interesting thing about Job? This is the greatest thing. It's rich with study that you can do at your own time. Job is a type of the children of Israel going through the tribulation. Amen. Because the nation of Israel, they're going through great tribulation like Job did. The devil attacked Job. The Antichrist, the devil, will attack Israel. And they go through hell on earth, great tribulation. And then Israel is currently in captivity, right? And they're not restored yet. Until after the tribulation, God restores his nation of Israel. And then God restores Job. But here's an interesting thing. What does God do with tribulation saints at Revelation 20? They're resurrected. Yeah, that's good stuff. See that? Isn't that interesting? Job is a perfect type. There's no doubt. He's a perfect type of a tribulation Jew. Yep. There's absolutely no doubt about it. It's rich with too many verses on that. Not only that, read the book of Ezekiel, the book of Isaiah, where God talks about restoring his nation of Israel. He mentions several times, I'm going to resurrect your bodies. See why um, people get confused with the post-tribulation rapture thing? That one's all completely tribulation saint for Jews. That's not Christian. Amen. Christian is totally different. These are all reserved for the nation of Israel. God has a plan for them.
Study the book of, study all the words of with captivity. Look up all the verses on Israel's restoration. You'd be amazed. It's a gold mine. So this so-called contradiction, it becomes even more of a gold mine, you're going to understand. So the thing is, let's conclude it with this. This so-called contradiction and problem right here is solved with the children. There's no doubt. They had to be resurrected. And the reason why is because I mentioned you the several points. It doesn't make sense to have 10 new children, too short of a time gap. If we were to argue he had multiple wives, his past experiences, and especially since he had one wife that time, you know, it'd be, lo it'd be more logical, it'd make more sense that he had one wife that time. Especially since his past wife told him to curse God and die. I don't think he wants more after that. The Bible was silent about his wife and never mentioned about his wife ever after that. But a cumulative total is a very logical Bible explanation because there are many verses that show it. And I mean many, not just these. You, if you've done Bible reading a lot, you will agree with me on that one. But not only that, I gave you a common sense example of how God would bless a certain person with a cumulative total. And it does go past and present, okay, when God gives you a cumulative total. That makes sense. But not only that, cumulative total is built up by the evidence of Job 42. It was giving you everything of what Job owned. It says, latter end from beginning. See? More at the latter end than the beginning. So it's giving you a cumulative total here. Not only that, the last verse in Job 42 gives you a cumulative total of Job's life. He lived old and full of days and he died. Okay? But not only that, the thing that convinced me the most was captivity. The Bible says the Lord turned the captivity of Job. Look at all the verses on captivity. It's about restoration. There's no doubt about that. And it talks about resurrection of Israel. Because it's so strong in that one, it's like I couldn't, get, I couldn't deny it after that. So uh, the Lord even told you, Job 42 verse 10, he turned the captivity of Job before he gave you the details of what he blessed him with. So the Lord's giving you like a hint here. That's good. What I blessed... All these details with Job has to do with turning his captivity. That's good stuff. So this is a gold mine in the Bible, actually, with the book of Job. So I hope you enjoyed this study.